All right, perfect. So also on my behalf, welcome everybody to our little dev day. And today in Agenda, we have four talks that try to be rather practical in nature. We look pretty close into the code. Um, we look at the application deployments, the architectures, how to use Vardin in certain environments. Um, Better will talk more about, say, the theoretical side, and I'll try to show you the more practical side. I hope Better agrees with me, as we really haven't seen each other's presentations before. But anyhow, so we'll get started with something called building impressive layout systems. Um, impressive in terms of, let's say, hopefully the technical quality, but also the visual quality in terms of what Vardin framework is able to provide for developers using that. And of course with this spice that it should work with mobile, desktop and tablets all together. So during this 45 minute talk we will start up by seeing how you would set up a Vardin UI uh, in terms of um, dependency injectable beans. How many of you new to Vardin or already with existing Vardin knowledge are using some dependency injection framework such as CDI or Spring. Quite many actually. And this is what I've been sort of anticipating. It's getting more and more popular and also it is able to provide you help and features for your application development that you just can't live without anymore. I hope I can convince people not using these systems um, to really try them out. Um, then in terms of Vardin, we will look into the navigation system, what kind of APIs it provides. Uh, the ones who've already been using Vardin for quite a long are probably familiar with these, but let's try to also bring something new for these guys in terms of the dependency injection. Um, we'll talk about how to compose application views with Vardin framework. And, of course, as we were supposed to build something impressive, we will look into something called responsive Valo menu. So Valo is the Vardin theme engine released with uh, Vardin 7.3 or whatever the version was. Um, at the end, we will look into a little bit of CDI and Spring events, how to fire events from your UI, how to react them in various Vardin uh, view compositions, and just very briefly talk about the security in terms of how to, for example, restrict access to certain views for a specific uh, user groups or role groups. And in the end, we will, of course, have a little Q&A. And at the end of the day, we, of course, have the longer Q&A session, so everybody can ask the questions. Also, then, if you happen to miss something during these talks. So let's start with the setting up part in UIs. Um, I've prepared a little example application for you. It's available in GitHub. Um, you don't have to clone it right now. It's there. You can have a look at it later. Um, maybe it's even better if you don't take it immediately, as then nobody's anymore paying attention to me but just to the code. So I'll be walking through the code. I'll show you what kind of things there are. And the application in itself is a multi-module Maven project that separates the backend from the UI. And in my next talk, right after Better, uh, we'll take a look at the backend side about the data binding. But now we'll start with the actual UI part. So this should look rather familiar to each and every one of you using Vardin. Just extension of the abstract UI base class, the way to set up Vardin. Vardin framework will then automatically bind the servlet URL to the UI and allow the developers to concentrate on their actual code within the UI so that framework takes care of the communication. In terms of uh, CDI or Spring, what you can do is that you simply annotate your class with an annotation called CDI UI or with Spring, Spring UI, which in practice means that this UI is made available as managed bean for the system. When it is a managed bean, it is possible that you can further inject or auto-wire with Spring additional resources into your application. 
And what's the benefit of injection-based approach? Well, the benefit is that you are actively giving the ownership of the code at runtime for the uh, dependency injection container that makes it possible to you to have much more loose coupling, interface-based dependencies, and just being able to write your code in terms of abstractions rather than having to have a direct dependencies into your actual concrete implementations. And for example, now with Vardin and with its Navigator API for building a navigable UI systems, it's quite often beneficial to implement some bean so that it implements some kind of an interface from Vardin Navigator. And then within your actual deployment, you can define what kind of actual bean that implements the interface is then deployed for the runtime. We'll get more closely into that. So the benefits of having your UIs as beans is that it's a very clear entry point. You don't have to have any kind of WebXML deployment descriptor, any kind of other configuration. It's just a bean living within your deployment, allowing you to start something called um, dependency injection chain, meaning that you can further gather other dependencies that then um, are as part of your uh, UI beans entry point. Your UIs are context aware. So for example, what happens if you open multiple browser tabs with your Vardin application is that each and every one of these browser tabs will have their own UI instance. In terms of beans, it's very important that the actual injected bean references know into which UI they belong to. So there is something called UI scoping, and UI beans are by default context aware of their own UI scope. UIs, of course, become very easily accessible through the direct URI. So you don't have to set up any kind of uh, UI providers, but rather just annotate your UIs with a corresponding bean names. And after this, you can access the UIs directly through your application URI. And of course, that works with CDI as well as with Spring Beans with the Spring UI annotation, as I mentioned. So with CDI UI, we were at this stage where we had defined our CDI UI annotation. And you could make another UI just by providing another name for your UI bean which gives you the ability to have additional UIs bound to your context path just by defining the name of the UI. So those of you who are familiar with body Navigator already and with, for example, the um, URI fragment part, that is the hashtag symbol at the end of the um, actual name of the UI, this is sort of one level above that, allowing you to have simply different application UIs bound to your context so that they are actually different injectable container managed beans. Is this something new to somebody, or is this something that everybody already knew? Ask two questions and then expect people to raise hands. So was this new to somebody? One or two, maybe. OK. Well, at least then we have formed very stable ground to build on. Um, talking about layouting, how to make layout systems within your UI, this is quite common. So you have some kind of a base layout on top of which you add, for example, your menus at the top or at the left, and you have the rightmost area available for your actual content. Um, these kind of features quite often uh, go in hand with a term called navigation. Um, Vardin has, ever since version 7, provided uh, a utility called Navigator that allows to register view compositions, a component compositions called views, which then make navigation in terms of um, view changing, allow you to change the entire composition um, from, uh, or let's say from, or with a name of one view to another so that you could, for example, build a menu that through Navigator makes it possible to change the actual views by just changing the URI fragment. Um, 
in terms of um, let's say dependent injection it's sometimes beneficial to um, for example have an interface that defines exactly the methods that you need just the methods that are relevant for your particular use case within your application um, in our example app that you can clone we have something called navigation manager that is just an interface that is implemented by our navigator B and this interface provides us a way to navigate into some specific view name as well as to query what the current view is. Um, since Vardin 7.5 it's been possible to extend navigator in terms of dependency injection. Before 7.5 you were not really able to have navigator uh, reasonably injected. But after 7.5 you are now able to make much more configurable let's say manager beans that take care of your entire navigation needs and in addition you can implement your own very specific interfaces on depending the use case that you might need with your navigation system. Um, view display is something that you already saw. For those who haven't been uh, using one in that long, view display is something that allows you to structure the actual content area with the components that you're using. So when you are, for example, navigating from a view to view, view display is a place that takes care of the view changing so that it provides you an API that allows you to react to the change of the view before the view is actually put into the place. So this way you can access the view before it is really shown. Um, there are various framework implementations provided with the framework depending on what kind of uh, view display you're using. There are various implementations for example for panels, for layouts, anything. These are automatically put in by the framework um, when you are navigating into something. But with for example the dependency injection world what is quite often beneficial is as you saw with this example that you have your navigation manager some kind of being implemented out of that by extending the actual body navigator and then within the context of this being you also define the view display to be able to make sort of a um, isolated package that completely takes care of your navigation needs within your application. Um, CDI view provider. Before CDI before Spring Beans, um, Body Navigator, of course, existed and it needed to have a way to access the views by their view name, which means that when user navigates into some view, what happens is that the navigator tries to look for a view implementation by its name. And for this, it uses the view provider. And of course, with the CDI, um, what we would like to achieve is that we have a being auto discovery, a mechanism that is able to discover our views when we need them without us having to register the views anywhere beforehand. And CDI view provider is exactly um, what we can use to be able to access our CDI uh, enabled view beans from the navigation system. So it allows us to have the view bean discovery in terms of um, finding the being by its name, but also allows us to have a access control per view in terms of, let's say, user roles based on what kind of roles the currently signed in user has. And it also allows us to override this functionality so that we can quite easily enable our own implementations if we want some kind of more strict um, access control. If you're using Spring uh, with the Vardin Spring add-on, the CDI view provider is called a uh, Spring view provider, of course. Anyway, it's just the very same uh, <laughs> idea being auto discovery, but just in terms of Spring in this case. The other things that uh, navigation in Vardin provides out of the box is something called view change listener. And view change listeners, of course, can also be implemented uh, from the navigation system point of view as interfaces 
uh, with their corresponding bin implementation and then further injected. View change listener is used for getting the access to the view change event before the view actually changes and immediately after the view has changed. This gives you the ability to, for example, cancel the navigation if the current view decides to deny it. And why would it want to do that? For example, you have some kind of form open where the user currently has unsaved changes. It would be nice to tell the user that would you please like to store your changes before you change the view, not to lose your work. So view change listener is the place that you should be considering to implement within your navigation system if you want to access the information of view changing before it actually occurs. So the ability to cancel the navigation is the, um, the most important part. I said that the UIs are context aware and I said that with CDI uh, with Spring, it's very important that you keep control of your beans in terms of um, which components belong to which UI. And each of the UIs have their own browser tab open within your browser. Say that. And you would not want to, for example, mix up the application menus between different UIs or you would not want to mix up your views or any other components between the UIs as that would of course cause a lot of problems and, and chaos in your application. So the CDI and Spring both provide uh, inviting integration terms, the UI scoped context that makes it possible to bind beans per UI instance. Um, for example, in our example project, we have our menu that implements the responsive menu layouting, which we'll look just in a moment. But this is, for example, a place where the UI scoped should be used, as you don't want to have your Valo menu in various different UI instances, as the component can, of course, only be added into one layout. And having that scoped for that same UI is the key for actually referencing the correct instance. So UI scoped is then, of course, correctly used when, let's say, beans or varding components that are supposed to be bound with one UI instance are, uh, on the bean level, defined to have the mentioned scope. So UI scoped allows you to associate the bean instances with a UI instance and also to allow you to associate the beans with a specific web browser tab. Very important. Um, and of course, the CDI UI which is the entry point for our UIs, is by default UI scoped. So it is a stereotype um, annotation. Is the scoping familiar to all of you? At least it's familiar to the ones who are using dependency injection frameworks. But if somebody talks about scopes and contexts, is there some people who find them currently not understandable. Everybody understands everything. It's exactly how it goes in Finnish elementary school. Nobody raises their hand. Um, I don't believe you. Maybe I should, but I'll just very quickly tell you something about it. So let's say that we have our DevDay UI, which is the example UI application that I'll be showing you in just a moment, um, annotated with CDI UI. So this means that the UI here is per browser tab, and all the content that is inside of that is then associated with the UI scope. But let's say that we have some other bean, let's say the currently signed in user, for example, who happens to be in session scope. Why this? Um, let's say that you log in in one of your applications, in one of the browser tabs, then you open another tab, you would not want to see the login screen again. So it makes sense to have your, let's say, the currently authenticated user as session scoped. And now that we see these three fancy little boxes here, what happens when I open another browser tab? What should happen with these boxes? Let's say I open three browser tabs, I get three UI instances, 
And for my UI scope, I also get three little scoping boxes that allow us to have the UI specific beans within their own box, meaning that one of these beans always associates with one of the UIs. But see here, the user <coughs> is still living within its own box as the user was shared between all these three UI instances. As if you have a web browser open with multiple tabs, all these tabs are still sharing within the server the same HTTP session, but not the same UI bean instance. So that's why the UI scoped context exists equally many times as the actual UIs, but the session scoped box is still from its point of view, just the one and only for that particular user session. Of course, if, if another user comes in, logs in, he will get his own little session scope box. But in terms of HTTP session, this is how it works for like one user seeing multiple different UIs. What about the views then? So view is a composition of components. And this was, I think, initially, uh, well, idea of any developer using Vardin, but I think the first guy who ever made this even remotely official was our CEO, Jonas. He wrote an add-on for Vardin 6 that then later on became uh, as core part of Vardin 7, which is today's navigator. And it had the very simple view of composing views out of component structures, um, which then are made accessible for the navigation system with the navigator implementation. And of course, the view, as I've already multiple times said, is positioned inside the actual view display, which is the content area that changes according to how you navigate with your application. So how that would look like is that we have our um, application with the menu on the left, the content area on the right, which is the view display. So the view display API is invoked every time user navigates somewhere. That's the place where you can have the view change listeners to prevent the navigation if you so like. Um, and also when the view has changed, when let's say the CDI view provider has discovered the view bean where you're attempting to navigate into, the content of the bean will be positioned within the content area, which is, of course, the display. So when you change the actual menus, then, of course, the content area is populated with the particular bean. And these beans, CDI view beans, you compose exactly the same way as you would compose your UI beans. So instead of CDI UI, you annotate them with CDI view. Um, as an example, we might have a customer view where we navigate into from the menu. We extend that from some Vardin root component, implement view interface from Vardin Navigator, and annotate that with CDI view and with the name of the view that we like to use that. And only, let's say, special part is the URI fragment here. So when you change from view to another, it is not causing any kind of, let's say, web page reload. But instead, what happens is that we are able to detect as a browser event the change of the URI fragment within your uh, web browser's URI bar and communicate this change to the server that then initiates the actual navigation process to switch the view composition. So everything that comes after the hashtag symbol is considered not to cause page reload once the actual content of the URI fragment part is changed. Um, equally, as you would have to um, scope your UI beans with the UI scoped, you should scope your view beans and everything you want to have as a view specific with the CDI view uh, view scoped annotation. So the idea is there that the beans um, annotated with view scoped are bound to one specific view. And the CDI view, of course, is again 
a stereotype, which is by default the view scope. And for Spring developers, the Spring view is the corresponding uh, way to define your view beans. Most of the, or let's say all of the uh, dependency frameworks, dependency injection frameworks provide some kind of scopes out of the box, and Vardin on top of that adds its own scopes that are relevant for Vardin applications. Um, in terms of CDI, there is a concept called application scoped. Um, it is something that is per deployment, meaning that you can have a bean that is shared between all the users of the same application deployment. Can you think of some classes, some beans within your code that would make sense to be application scoped? What kind of things would you application scope? Exactly, configuration. Um, because quite often we see code written by developers that for each UI reloads the configuration from a configuration file or from some data source. Uh, makes quite often much more sense to have at least the common parts of the configuration loaded up once the application is deployed, once it's configured. After that, you could just inject your configuration bean into any of the UIs, but it would still be the same instance, preserving you more resources. Um, for each user, there is, of course, a session scoped. Uh, session scoped is by the HTTP session, which means that if you have multiple browser tabs, again, open, they would all share the same session scoped, but for each logged in user, you would have a separate session. So you could say that the session scoped is a sub part of application scoped content. Uh, UI scoped is something that lives within session scope and you can have multiple instances of these per one session. And of course, within your UI, when you do the navigation, there are multiple different views. So each bean consisting of, of various components is the CDI view, and the other beans within there should then be view scoped. Um, in terms of hierarchy, we could have for each concurrent user a session scope under our application scope, each of the users could have multiple UIs, and each UI could have multiple different views. Considering, for example, the uh, event communication uh, ways how you could fire events with your dependency injection framework uh, within your application, in terms of CDI, the events always travel from bottom upwards. So if within your view you, for example, fire an event that says that the customer has clicked save button, now we should store the current forms content, you could listen for this event within your view, within your UI scope, session scope, or even all the way up to the application scope. But you can't make the events travel um, sideways. So always just upwards. Let's do something fun. This has been very... Uh, Firing uh, experience for everybody on Tuesday morning. Let's have a look at the responsive um, UI. So the example application that we have, um, we will take a look at the structure much more closely um, in the next talk of mine, but now let's just concentrate on the actual UI module part. Um, the application itself is something that is deployed to Wildfly application server, mainly to enable us to have the uh, CDI implementation in place. You could, of course, do that with Tomcat, even if you just uh, provided the implementation by yourself, for example, by copying in the weld libraries. Mm, other reasons for using Wildfly is that I can more easily deploy the backend, but we'll talk about those later. Um, the responsive UI means, in terms of our application such that this is our example app. Can you see it? It's rather uh, light in terms of content. Um, responsive UI is quite often considered as ability to have your UI uh, change depending on which 
device the user is using for accessing the user. And back in the day, it was somewhat popular to have the idea that you would have different UI implementation per different device. But then came the responsive web design thoughts, which mean practically that you have one implementation and it should adapt to um, user's actual device. Um, Vardin Framework provides you with its theme engine ability to define styles that are um, sort of grouped by the size ranges of the current browser device. Um, if I start dragging the window smaller here, what happens is that in terms of responsivity, the menu is shrinked to a button and then all the way down to a smaller um, version of that. Apparently, with the current resolution, I can't even show you the <coughs> biggest menu size, which would be the um, way to have the names and icons side by side instead of being on top of each other. But um, this gives us ability, for example, to de test the um, UIs also for example, with Chrome Developer Tools, um, we could, for example, enable the uh, iPad uh, resolutions, just flip around the device and see how the UI behaves in, in various devices. And this is, I would say, one of the cool features of the framework that it is able to adapt its UI components together with its theme to make it possible for developers to write the code only once and still with the style ranges make it work on various different devices. Is some of you currently using the responsive features of the... Right. Um, how this works on the code level is that... Well, as you already saw from the from the uh, example, our content area is of course the key that we want to maximize for the user and in terms of being able to shrink the menu away. So uh, once the area gets smaller, the menu also gets smaller, but we try not to sacrifice any space from the content area. Uh, if we still have a look at it with the smaller device, the menu is moved uh, behind a pop-up menu content at the top bar, and then we can even shrink it down in size of let's say, mobile uh, smartphone use cases. How this works is that since Varin 7.2, there has been an extension called Responsive, which is nowadays part of the core, so you don't have to download any, any extensions. Only criteria for using this extension is that the parent component in which the extension is used should be relatively sized. Um, reasoning is that with relative size, we of course mean uh, percentage sizes. So let's say that the parent component is defined, for example, to be 100% wide, then it takes the entire uh, area available within the browser, and the framework is then able to resize the component once the actual uh, surrounding browser uh, size changes, or the browser window size, or the device window size. And with that, with the relative size, we can then have a pixel-specific <laughs> size ranges that change the actual style with CSS to correspond to the current size of the device. Um, very simple use case how you could use the responsive is that you make a CSS layout, add some style name to it, make it relative sized with, for example, the set size full, and then just say, uh, with a static method from the responsive class, make responsive and the layout. Afterwards, you could, uh, sorry for the bad color choice apparently, um, you could then define the styles with your CS layout, with the responsive uh, CSS selector class, and then with it symbol and the width range, with the corresponding pixel ranges that you like. Um, the actual 
UI in Vardin and within its menu is implemented exactly like this, but so that the styles are provided for you already on the framework theme level, so you can just use the actual Vardin um, follow menu through the CSS uh, class name. There is one little catch in Valo menu. It's set of styles in Valo theme, but unfortunately, I don't know how it's possible. But there is no framework level API for using the Valo menu. So what that means is that to be able to uh, use it, you should today, till today, um, write some code like this. So this is the actual implementation of the um, follow menu in my example application that brings down when the size of the browser is changed. Um, there are helpers like the static follow theme class that has certain public strings which correspond to the CSS style names. Uh, this means that you can rather easily define the menu root, the menu part, and the menu item. These are the three main style names that you are going to have to use. But right now, Vardin doesn't provide you a component that would do this out of the box for you. But you can, of course, just clone the uh, example application that we have right here and just use these uh, style names within your own application. Just have a look from here how it's done. But unfortunately, right now, the framework level does not provide you with a server-side Java API that would allow you to access the styles unless you write the class by yourself. Um, with the menu, there is also the menu button. So it's the regular uh, Vardin button right up here. And if we take it a bit bigger size, the button, of course, disappears. So how that's been implemented is just that with a regular Vardin button, there is uh, something called Valo menu visible uh, style name that is then passed for the uh, button to make it appear or disappear. In terms of, of server-side development, this is still rather straightforward way to achieve the responsiveness without having to know that much about what really goes on in the browser, but just with the little warning that you should have to um, know CSS by um, CSS class selectors on the level that you're able to specify a few style names on various uh, component layers within your menu. But after that, the framework practically gives you for free ability to, to do responsive design so that all the sizes are scaled up or down according to current device and the current device uh, orientation. And really, there is the live example within the uh, Save Day application. Just very briefly about the event. So I already mentioned that you are able to fire events within your application uh, to achieve, let's say, as loose coupling of application beans, application components, uh, as you ever like. And quite often, firing events make sense if you have, let's say, UIs built up from various reusable component compositions where you don't want to register listeners and observers with each others. So. The dependency injection frameworks allow you to fire uh, any kind of Java pocho, plain old Java object, through an event bus, which, for example, within the uh, possible customer editor example, would work so that um, you, for example, within menu click, uh, see which menu item was clicked, and then just fire the event within your uh, event source that you have injected uh, from your uh, dependency injection framework. And then, for example, in a navigation manager, you would just observe for the same um, navigation event 
with a method that has at observes annotation for its uh, method parameter. And this is all you need for coupling these two items together, meaning that these beans don't have to know each other, you don't have to register them, you don't have to add any kind of listeners, but rather only thing you have to have is that they are living within the same scope or within the same scope range, so that from your view you can fire the event upwards to your UI, to your session, to your application scope, if you like, but without really having to have any kind of connection between them. And this is at least one of the biggest benefits starting the Vardin UI uh, framework level development with uh, dependent injection framework. So the events there travel upwards. I have like one minute of time, so very briefly about the security and access control. Um, CDI view provider has a method, is user having access to view? And this method is always invoked before the view is even attempted to be navigated into. Um, the default implementation checks whether the view beans have roles allowed annotation, and if these roles then correspond to the roles of the currently signed in user. And this works in, in some cases, but let's say that they are rather static. Um, if you have ability to define your own roles within your application environment, then it's quite often beneficial to override the is user having access to view implementation. For example, with some kind of bean that is able to check from your application environment whether this current, current user actually is having the roles or user rights that, that are required for navigating into a specific view. Uh, the default implementation that is used for roles allowed is within Comvar in CDI access control uh, bean, and this can of course also be overwritten for fine-tuning how the roles allowed um, mechanism. And by default it's of course the Java authentication and authorization um, system implementation that allows you to navigate, uh, sorry, uh, to log into your uh, application through the uh, security realms defined within your um, application server, place that defines for example all the roles. And once you've logged in then you can acquire a subject which corresponds to your current designed in user and check if he is in a specific role. And this is what the default implementation for access control is doing with the CDI view provider when you try to navigate into various views. Did we learn something? Hmm, blank. So we learned, hopefully, that bean-based UIs provide rather easy enterprise integration. Uh, you see much more about this also in my second talk about how to do the data binding, um, where we connect with our backend services from our UI just by injecting a reference to our backend service. Um, Vardin officially supports, of course, CDI and Spring Beans-based integration systems, but nothing prevents you using some other third-party implementation as well, if necessary. Uh, for any kind of view change management systems, the navigator with its utility API is really the only reasonable way to go. So this is implemented on the framework level, this is utilizable through your beans, so you should definitely always, when making the groundwork for your next Vardin application, use this kind of um, pre-given API for, for doing that. Um, responsive add-on integrates quite, quite nicely the Valo theme with the browser uh, window size um, change detection events, allowing you just on the CS level to define what kind of styles you should apply for um, your components when viewed with a different device. So the big benefit of this is that you don't have to make separate UI, separate views for different devices, but only change your theme to adapt the various resolutions. And finally, the events provide way to very loosely couple your component compositions that you've built with 
previously mentioned APIs so that the end result is very concise little functional pieces that work together without really having to know the specifics of their internal implementation. Great, this is for this part all I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Thank you.